We have been looking for many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, will our people do their duty in the matter? Can we not assist in lifting the standard and in calling to the front those who have a regard for their religious rights and privileges? Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Let, let us kneel for a word of prayer. Gracious Father, which art in heaven, we want to thank you for traveling mercy this evening. We want to thank you in a special way for your goodness towards us, though we do not deserve it. As you have brought us safely here, to spend a moment in your word, we pray that you would also be in our midst. Bless each one that hears the word of these prophecies, as you have said in the book of Revelation. And I pray that ultimately that Jesus will be lifted up. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to look at a subject this evening, still dealing with faith that we have been looking at for the past few weeks. And before we go to the book of Numbers, which is the book that we're going to be going to to begin this evening, that will be Numbers chapter 14. And as you are turning there, let me draw your attention to this article that I started to view and quote it from yesterday from a different Bible study. The headline says, How the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and what are the next two words unbelieving. unbelieving church scrolling through Facebook I happen upon a simple yet interesting post one of the comments was even more intriguing show me the verse in scripture that says God heals everything but coronavirus instead of boldly standing in authoritative opposition to a wicked threat the common reaction of so many of today's American Christians seems to be unbelief. Those who are to be driven by fearless faith are instead shaken by the winds of the world. As if everything here that we are experiencing has taken the church by surprise. We have forgotten that we are followers of Jesus Christ. We have forgotten as a church that we serve the Almighty God, that He is not a God of wood, of stone, of anything else you can think of that cannot breathe, hear, taste, but it is the living God. We have forgotten about the living God as this article is rebuking us as Christians, especially as Seven Adventists. It says, in our current crisis, I'm stunned and saddened by the reaction of supposed Christians to the few who are rallying the troops to arise in faith and healing. Have you heard anything like this? Those faithful few who are trying to rally in the troop and to encourage God's people and to continue to pick up the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to go to the front line and to face this deception the pandemic, which is a deception. But those of us, the faithful few who are doing this, are being met by all kinds of hostility, not from the world now, from within. It goes on to say, these cries for the church to confidently confront the spirit of the age and to believe without wavering in the healing power of Jesus are being met with resistance. How can that be? Oh, faithless generation, are the words that came to my mind that Jesus said 2,000 years ago to the church. Let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 14. There we're going to find also the same situation. A faithless generation that God, through his uh, miraculous power, brought out of Egypt. He had brought them out of Egypt. He displayed his power there so that they would not 
be unfaithful. Yet, that same generation, shortly after the Exodus, even shortly after God departed the Red Sea and annihilated the Egyptian army who pursued after them, yet they fell into unbelief. The Bible says in chapter 14 of the book of Numbers, are you there? Are you there, saints? In chapter 14 of the book of Numbers, notice carefully with me, let's begin in verse 11. The Bible says in verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? In spite of all the signs, they still did not believe. They still were complaining in spite of everything else. They were still a faithless generation. And the Bible says, keep on down with me. God pronounced judgment upon them because of their unbelief in verse 12. But let's go to verse 22 this time. The Bible says in verse 22, it says, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and I have not hearkened to my voice, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely what would happen to them? To those who did not believe, who were practicing unbelief. The Bible says in verse 23, Surely they shall not see the what? The land, the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. God brought them out of Egypt, right? With his mighty powers. As a matter of fact, he reminded them that I have brought you unto myself. I have brought you out of Egypt. I have placed you under my eagle's wings, as the Bible describes it. Now they have fallen into unbelief. And if God does not do something right away with the ones who are practicing unbelief, they will corrupt the others. And God says, you will not enter the promised land. Keep in mind, they were in the wilderness, very close to the promised land. Very close to the promised land. Today, Satan is doing the same thing as we are heading towards midnight. Midnight. We are in some of the darkest hours of this world history. Yet, the majority of the church, as the children of Israel, has fallen into unbelief. They said, well, this crisis that's happening right now, we shouldn't do anything about it. They are listening to Ted Wilson. They are listening to the Jesuit within the General Conference. They said, the crisis that's taking place right now, we should just obey it. That's not the crisis. It's not the quote-unquote the Sunday law crisis when it has everything to do with the Sunday law crisis. This crisis here has everything to do with it. Notice, let's continue to read. Go to verse 26 this time. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this, notice, evil congregation? What's the evil congregation? That's the church. Why? Because of their unbelief. Then it says, Which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. What would happen to them? Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless. Ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Think about this for a moment. Out of a whole generation that came out of Egypt, only two men from that generation, God says, will make it to the promised land. Out of a whole generation, now, we're talking about thousands of people here. God says, we'll perish in the wilderness. That generation will not make it. 
their children, their grandchildren will inherit the land. But from that specific generation, only two faithful men. Two faithful men. Can you imagine this? Today, we have 22 million members within this denomination. The majority of them will die in the wilderness. That's not my wish for them. But because of unbelief, that's what happened to the children of Israel. Keep in mind again, God brought them out of Egypt. Egypt represents sin, right? Just like God wants us to have victory over sin. But because of unbelief, the majority of us will not make it to the promised land. Just like the article says, how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed an unbelieving church. Indeed, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. This crisis has revealed the character of the church, but has revealed the character of each one of us while we are, one more time, heading closer to midnight, much closer to midnight. Go to the book of Mark this time, speaking of a faithless generation. Notice what Jesus says in the book of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Another passage I would like for you to keep in mind is where Jesus says, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth from his people? Shall he find faith on the earth? Notice, the Bible says in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is speaking here, rebuking this faithless generation. Let's begin by looking at verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them, and straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which have a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. What kind of generation was that generation? Faithless generation. What kind of generation are we? Think about this. Are we part of that faithless generation? Now keep in mind, whatever happened then will happen again. Nothing new under the sun. The history of the children of Israel will be repeated, is being repeated as we speak. Faithless generation and many of them will die. Their carcasses will remain in the wilderness. Now the word faithless that the Bible used there means exactly what we are seeing on the screen here. Without belief in the revealed truths of religion. That's what that word faithless there means in the Greek. Number two, not believing, not giving credit to, not adhering to allegiance or duty, disloyal, perfidious, treacherous, as a faithless subject, not true to a master or employer, neglectful as a faithless servant, not true to the marriage covenant, false as a faithless husband or wife, not observant of promises. What's the next word there? Deceptive. Brothers and sisters, has that happened unto us? We have been deceived as a church by something that is called coronavirus, which is none other than a pandemic that they have fabricated and bringing false report on a daily basis about it just to continue to multiply the fear mongering and i'm going to show you this in a moment we need some faithful men in these last days as daniel as the three hebrew boys were faithful in babylon the same way we just read about caleb and joshua those men were faithful let's go to the book of mark mark chapter 16 Mark chapter 16. Well, we're still in the book of Mark. Let's go to chapter 16 this time. Oh, faithless generation. Notice carefully again, the church there was about to exercise 
more unbelief after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They did not believe. Notice the Bible says in chapter 16, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, let's begin in verse 12, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Notice again, they did not believe. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Why? Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was, what now? Risen. The same unbelief today is being exercised. Amen? Amen? It's being exercised. Are we part of this? This is a time when the church, as Daniel, one more time, is supposed to get on its knees. As the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 4, when the disciples were being threatened to stop healing and preaching in the name of Jesus, they went and had a prayer meeting. Not that God will remove the persecution, the mountains, the trials, but that God will give them boldness to continue to preach in the name of Jesus. You see, the Bible tells us that in many passages we're going to look at in a moment, how the people exercise unbelief and Christ over and over again had to rebuke them. This is the time when the church was supposed to be standing up as a light on a hill and to sound the warning to the inhabitants of the world of what is yet to come because we have not seen anything yet. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 12. This is a time when the righteousness, the church should, was supposed to proclaim the righteousness of Jesus and said that Jesus is greater than what is happening. This is what Daniel did. When the king enacted this law, which went against the law of God, which was in confliction with the word of God, with the laws of God, Daniel understood what was taking place, the great controversy. And he went as he has done many times before, opened his windows and prayed towards his God. Why? Because his God, he believed that his God was greater than King Darius. Hence, Matthew chapter 12. Notice in the book of Matthew chapter 12. Do we believe that Jesus is greater than anything, than any government? Yes or no? Yes. Notice in Matthew chapter 12, again, the people were exercising unbelief. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 12, let's begin in verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he said, and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What did Jesus call the church there? Evil. Again, he was speaking to the church. He was talking to the church. He called the church an evil and adulterous generation. He was talking about spiritual adultery here. Because of their unfaithfulness. Faithless generation. Is that us today? Notice. Seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. But notice. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, notice carefully, this is where God had sent Jonah to preach. Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. Question, who is this generation he's referring to? The church he's, he's talking to. So God, Christ, is comparing the church with a hidden nation. What was the hidden nation? Nineveh. A hidden nation. In what context? Notice. Again, he says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, the church, and shall condemn it, 
because they repented, Nineveh repented, at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here, yet the church did not believe the preaching of Jesus Christ. Yet the people in Nineveh believe in the teaching and preaching, warning of Jonah, and they repented in ashes and sackcloth. Yet the church today have rejected the warnings, the message for this time. Same thing that's happening today, no difference. But then Christ says, a greater than Jonah is here. That's what Daniel knew when the decree was passed. Daniel knew that there was a greater than Darius. So he would not worship Darius for 30 days. He went to his room as he has done billions of times before and worship his God. Notice another one. This time, let's back up to same chapter. Let's now back up to verse 6. But notice, it says, well, let's back up to get context here. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day. Chapter 12. We're still in the same chapter. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he answered and unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger, and that they were with him? how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, notice, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But, verse 6, I say unto you that in this place, is one greater than the temple. Who was greater than the temple? Jesus. Jesus Christ. He was greater than the temple. Yet, there was the same unbelief that was being manifested then as in the case of the children of Israel who saw, as God says to Moses, they saw all the signs, the wonders that I have done in Egypt. Yet, they were still practicing unbeliefs. And as spirit of prophecy tells us here, this age presents a sad picture to those whose eyes have been opened to discern the evils that prevail on every hand. The fear and love of God have almost left the world. This is the time prophesied of by Isaiah. When darkness, notice, shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, multitudes, are led away by the delusions of a faithless generation and are living in the darkness of errors. Go to Isaiah chapter 60 this time. Isaiah chapter 60. Where are we heading to? Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 60. This is where we find this quotation there that darkness is covering the whole earth and what God's people need to be doing at this time. The Bible says in verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. What must we do? When we see darkness is covering the earth, as we are experiencing it right now, is it a time for us to exercise unbelief? Or is it the time to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Is it also a time to say, to give us boldness that we may preach the gospel to the ones that are dying in ignorance? Is it also a time to say that we ought to obey God rather than men? Notice this article here. This is from Brett Bard, August 7th, 2020. Watch Christians outsmart Democrats governor 
to worship God at Walmart. Christian worshipers outsmarted Pennsylvania's fascist Democrat governor by gathering to praise God inside a Walmart, which, unlike the church, has been deemed, what's the word? Essential. We have governments around this world that have classified the church of God as non-essential. Yet, the majority of the leaders within this denomination have accepted this, that the church is non-essential. While we have Christians not of our faith exercising their religious rights, what have they done? Well, since the government there said that this store is quote-unquote essential and the church is not essential, what did they do? They went inside of that store and have worship service there. Amen. Amen? Amen. They went inside of that store. Yet, the majority of Seventh-day Adventists are listening to Ted Wilson to wear your mask, social distancing, and even, in some cases, if some churches, Seventh-day Adventist churches, are allowed to have Sabbath services, they have to follow all the Jesuits' guidelines, protocols, social distancing, wearing your mask, and even face shield on the pulpit. And I'm going to show you this. This is a sad reality. When this whole thing is a pandemic, is a scandemic, this virus was man-made, but at the same time, it is not as deadly as the common flu that every nation on the face of the planet experience on a yearly basis. But because this is not really about a pandemic, because it's really about what they call the new normal, the new world order, the great reset, because it's really about to put a muzzle over the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel messages, and even the fourth angel's message. This is what it's really about. It's really about what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, and because the devil knoweth that he has but a short time. Satan knows that he has but a short time. Jesus is coming again. Do you believe this? Yes. And this is the time that the church... As the Bible says, we need to arise, shine, for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. But where is the church of God now? Who quote unquote profess to believe we have the truth. Yes, we have the understanding of Bible prophecy. Where are they now? To expose this pandemic. Notice this next article here. Notice this is from UK. It says, may scrap coronavirus daily death toll after what experts find officials over exaggerating count report alleges notice they have done what over exaggerating the count what they have been doing is to tell you that this person that have died from a motorcycle accident, really died of COVID-19. This person that have died of colon cancer, as I covered yesterday, really died of COVID-19 because they want you to believe that there is really a reason, a good reason to put you on lockdown, to cause you to wear your mask, and to put the churches, the main target, the church is on lockdown because of the spread of coronavirus. With their own mouth, they are admitting that they are over-exaggerating the counts. It says, the conclusions of the review, which was ordered by Matt Hancock, after it emerged, officials were over-exaggerating deaths from the virus are expected this week. One expected recommendation would be to stop daily reporting altogether and move to a weekly official death toll. Instead, a government source said on Saturday night, their whole pandemic is being exposed. Remember the Bible says, there is nothing that is done in darkness that shall not be revealed. If God's people were faithful, were faithful for the past few months since we've been experiencing this crisis, 
many more people would have been exposed to the light. This pandemic would not have taken so many by surprise. And many countries right now, even in Melbourne, and even in New Zealand right now, they went back into lockdown. Did you know that? They went back into lockdown in New Zealand. If God's people were faithful right now in proclaiming the message, exposing this, the majority of the people around the world would not have accepted this lockdown. They would not have accepted it. When you put a muzzle over the gospel of Jesus Christ, the proclamation of the message for this time, then the world has been left under full control of Satan. Notice the next one here. Just to show the fake-demic, the pandemic. Gilling, Golden Farms employee found dead after contracting COVID-19, August 10th, 2020, from this fake news media from Melbourne, Australia, 7news.com. It says, a Victorian chicken plant worker has been found dead in his home after contracting COVID-19. Calvin, 51, reportedly contracted the virus at the Golden Farms plant at Breakwater, which has been linked to 44 cases. The man's body was discovered at his Newcomb home on Sunday afternoon. Now keep in mind, this is in Victoria, Melbourne, where they have lockdown. In order to justify the lockdown, you have to keep reporting that the cases are going up. That's how you brainwash people, right? Listen carefully. Victoria has recorded the highest number of deaths in a single day during the pandemic. 19 people have lost their lives and there have been 322 new cases. Estelle Greepink is in Melbourne for us this morning. Estelle, Premier Daniel Andrews says that this virus does not discriminate. And it certainly doesn't. We have seen deaths from all different age groups over the last couple of days. And sadly, today is our deadliest day of the pandemic so far. 19 deaths, as you say, 14 of those from aged care settings. We obviously have had outbreaks across a number of nursing homes right across Victoria. One positive from this press conference, though, it appears that our case numbers could be slowly decreasing. 322 new cases. That's significantly lower than some of the peaks we've seen in the pandemic so far. Hopefully this means, Anne, that these measures are working, including mandatory mask wearing, social distancing and the closure of non-permitted businesses. But still, some people continue to flout the rules. Victoria Police has fined 200... Okay, brothers and sisters, what's happening here is nothing but fake news. Those people make a living in lying, basically. They lie for a living. What you just heard there from this news media and with a serious look on their faces it's nothing but lies they told us that that man died of COVID-19 that man did not die of COVID-19 here is the Facebook page of that same news media outlet in Melbourne Australia these are some of the comments that some people are leaving there calling this news media out for their lies. Notice, one person says, dies from cancer. Very sad, but don't blame COVID. Also, you can justify the harm you causing this country. Absolute liars. Another person says, this is disgraceful, exploiting this man's terminal cancer for your news headline. You guys should be disgusted in yourselves. Another person says, people in Geelong, knew him, knew this guy who died of cancer, and the people that worked with him mentioned he was battling cancer for ages. Channel 7, what a shame on you for saying he died from COVID when it was cancer. My advice to you is to turn the TV off. Don't listen to those fake news media. With a straight face, they are lying to you. Those people are possessed by demons. Those are demons who are speaking through those people. How can you, with a straight face, give news like that, tell news like that of someone who died, obviously, from cancer, and then you are saying it was COVID-19? Nobody dies of anything nowadays except COVID-19. 
all of the other diseases have been put on lockdown. You have no permission to die from cancer, from malaria, from tuberculosis, no permission. If you die from those, we are going to, if you break, broke the law, if you broke the law and you die from tuberculosis without our permission, we are going to still classify it as COVID-19. And we are afraid to expose this lie that came straight from the devil. And as I stated before, here it is. This is New Zealand now. It says New Zealand is hit with another five suspected coronavirus cases as the nation is plunged back into lockdown just for five cases. They put the entire nation on lockdown over fresh outbreak and a stunning theory about how the virus reemerge is revealed. Theory. This lady here, again, good friend. She's the prime minister there of New Zealand. Good friend of Bill Gates. She's just listening to what Bill Gates tells her to do, and she does it. And she's putting her own people on lockdown just to please Bill Gates. Just to please Bill Gates. And then while they are telling you, well, it's because we're trying to keep you safe from the virus. You know what's happening? It's not the virus that's killing people. The lockdown is killing people. Isolation is killing people. Mental depression, that's what's killing people. But that's what the whole thing is about, is to kill you. This is not about to keep you safe. While they are putting, now I want you to, to see this deception here. While they are putting nations on lockdown, cities on lockdown, because of quote unquote coronavirus, notice what this says here. From the Daily Mail, nearly 18,000 California inmates, including murderers, could be released early due to coronavirus. Wait a minute now. Think, think, think for a moment. Where were those murderers that they are releasing? Where were they? In prison, right? Now, prison means lockdown, right? Yeah. They were already on lockdown. Why are you releasing them? If in reality you're trying to contain a virus, you put a whole nation on lockdown, why are you releasing prisoners who were already on lockdown? Does it make sense? No. It does not make sense. But you, do you know why they're doing this? It's because they're making room for you and I. They're releasing the criminals and they're making room for you and I. That's what's behind it. Because they know that there will be a few who will try to resist the power that be. So therefore, they're cleaning out the prison cells and making room for you and I. So be it, brothers and sisters. They made room for Peter, remember? They made room for the disciples. But what happened while Peter was in jail, in prison? He was sleeping, and then an angel came, and then put the guard to sleep, and then pff, opened the, the prison doors, and then even Peter was so at peace that he, he had no idea what was happening. He was sleeping peacefully. He didn't care about what the power that be was doing. Paul and Silas in prison, what were they doing? Singing. And what happened? A big earthquake. Do you want God to manifest his power today? Stand up for him, and after they throw him in jail, you'll see what God will do. Amen. But you will never see it Amen. if you are too chicken. Amen. You'll never see it. Notice, let's read. In April, 3,500 inmates were released, followed by another 6,900 in July. Currently, 700 offenders who have less then one year to serve and 6,500 people who have been classified as high risk by the federal receiver are being considered. The numbers and the estimated total of 17,600 came in filing last week when officials raised the estimated total from 10,400 with a federal judge. It goes on to say, across the U.S. over, notice, 100,000 people have been released from state and federal prisons between March and June. Out of the 100,000 releases, what happened? Two people 
have been shot and killed by release inmates in Denver and Tampa in Florida. So what they're doing is not only making room for you and I, but they will also use those criminals to go after you. That's what's going on right now. Does it make sense? No. Does it make sense? No. Lockdowns mean lockdowns. And again, we are not just talking about somebody who was in jail for violating, let's say, traffic laws and things like that. We're talking about murderers. So the coronavirus are releasing as a result of the pandemic. The coronavirus is setting the prisoners free, is setting the lawbreakers free, but the law-abiding citizens are the ones now who become the criminals. Do you see it? It's the new normal. Remember, that's what they say, the new normal. It's a great reset. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. Review and Herald, March 31st, 1910, paragraph 2. In many ways, Satan is revealing, what's the word there? Revealing, that he rules the world. He is influencing the hearts of men and corrupting their minds. Men in high places are giving evidence that their thoughts are evil continually. Many are seeking after riches and a scruple not to add to their wealth through fraudulent transactions. The Lord is permitting, notice carefully, the Lord is permitting these men to expose one another in their evil deeds. Some of their iniquitous practices are being laid open before the world. That thinking men who still have a desire in their hearts to be honest and just with their fellow men may understand why God is beginning to send his judgment on the earth. The Lord will surely punish the world for its iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. What message does the world need at this time? The proclamation of the first, second, third angel's messages. We need a few good men in these last days. A few faithful good men and women in these last days. Where can we find them? Which generation is going to make it to the promised land? Where can we find those faithful few good men not within the general conference notice this here this says watch fame pastor john MacArthur reportedly threatened by los angeles for holding indoor services welcomes assembly to what are the next two words peaceful protests triggers standing ovation fame pastor john MacArthur, who reportedly has been threatened by the city of Los Angeles with a daily fine of $1,000 or arrest for his in-church assembly, had a blunt response on Sunday as he began conducting service. We've covered some articles before dealing with what that pastor has been doing. They have some stringent rules there where the churches cannot reopen cannot congregate, cannot praise the Lord, cannot worship, but he has been defying these orders and he said, we will obey Jesus Christ, not Caesar. And when you look at his congregation, they have no mask. Now this was last Sunday. I dare you, go to most Seventh-day Adventists today doing Sabbath service. You will see social distancing, wearing of mask, and keep your distance. And you won't see anything like this as we are seeing here on the screen. Listen carefully here. Keep in mind, we're supposed to be Protestants, right? Yes. And we are supposed to expose Babylon. And Babylon, the Pope of Rome, gave us COVID-19, right? Listen carefully to what he has to say. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to welcome you to the uh, Grace Community Church Peaceful Protest. What? Peaceful Protest. We 
Thank you. <laughs> Are you glad to be here? I think so. Everything for us based on the Word of God, right? And uh, that means we are pro-life, pro-family, pro-law and order, and pro-church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it would have been so amazing to have such a leader. Knowing what we know, they don't know what we know. They don't keep the Sabbath. They don't know the prophecies as we know it. But in spite of the fact, they don't have spirit of prophecy. In spite of the fact that they don't have spirit of prophecy, they do not have the understanding that we have, but with the amount of light that they have, they are using it. And this man has been exposing the Pope of Rome as well. Again, without having spirit of prophecy. If we had such a leader, what a powerful testimony it would be. Yet, the leader within this denomination is still in a cave somewhere, hiding, making six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes videos. I'm referring to Ted Wilson in case you did not know. Making six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes videos every Sabbath. That's all the flock needs. And then brainwashing us. Brainwashing us while he's still hiding in his cave and then telling you to social distancing, wear your mask. It is an abomination. It is apostasy. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will what? Do what? Stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Not men who will be hiding in a cave and making six, seven minutes videos as Ted Wilson have been doing. Men who will go to the front line as this pastor did. Now, his congregation, you should see it. Uh, we've covered this before last week. Hundreds of people. No social distancing, no mask. You could see him on the stage there. And behind him, no mask, nothing. And they are happy to be back and to worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Where they are being told over there, you cannot sing. You cannot sing praises to God because when you sing that shouting, it spreads the COVID-19. And we cannot see that this is a muzzle on the gospel of Jesus Christ? We cannot see that. Meanwhile, I want you one more time to take a good look at this pastor. He's there behind his pulpit. He doesn't have any mask. And there's no social distancing. Now I'm going to show you a contrast. This picture here comes from a Seventh-day Adventist church by the name of Northside Church. You can see in this picture here, this is a lady here sitting, one of the members, sitting, I'm guessing, in the front pew, because you can see the pulpit there, as the service is about to begin. But what does she have on her face? Can you see it? She not only is wearing mask, but she also has a face shield. Who told us to do this? Jesuit Fauci, who said this? At a Seventh-day Adventist church, what's out there that we are afraid of? What's out there? So there's a virus inside of the church? One more time. Jesus says, Oh, faithless generation. Amen? Oh, faithless generation. There is one greater than the temple. There is one who is greater than Jonah. Yet, we are worshiping Fauci. We are, we are worshiping Ted Wilson. It's a sad reality. Now, I'm going to show you something even worse. At the same church, Northside Seventh Adventist Church. Notice at the church there. This person here, I'm guessing the pastor or the elder, is wearing a face mask. And here is the pulpit. Look at the pulpit. There's a face shield there. 
There's a face shield there on the pulpit. And here is somebody, maybe an elder, with face mask inside of the church of Jesus Christ. This is an abomination. Now, here is the speaker preaching the sermon. The sermon was about Joseph, something like that. And there he is, not only with face mask on, but with a face shield. Blocking what? The droplets, as Fauci said, that's coming your way? This is an abomination. This is not the church of God. This is not the church of God. We are Seventh-day Adventists, knowing what we know, and yet we are going to do something like that? Putting a face shield on the pulpit and then face mask on? What? Notice the contrast again with this pastor. Do you see any face shield here? No. Now this was last Sunday. He preached that sermon. This here was on Sabbath. Now, if I were without saying anything to you, if I were to show you a picture of this Seventh Adventist church pulpit, as this speaker is speaking, speaking there, and then show you a picture of that Sunday pastor, which one would you say is the true church? The Sunday one. Which one would you say is the true church? Which one would you say is worshiping one that's greater than Fauci? Would you say the Seventh Adventist Church? No, that's apostasy and that's abomination. They have removed God. God is not there. God is not there. This is a different spirit that they are worshiping here inside of the Seventh Adventist Church. You're not going to find Jesus Christ there. Because if you believe that Jesus is greater, is greater than the virus, is greater than Pope Francis, is greater than the virus, why would you put a face shield on the pulpit? And then why would a speaker speaking behind an Adventist pulpit be wearing mask and a face shield? That means you believe that the virus is greater than Jesus, that the Pope of Rome is greater than Jesus. That's a pure abomination. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy says. The prevailing spirit of our time is that of infidelity. And what else? Apostasy. A spirit of pretended illumination. Notice it says pretended. Because of a supposed knowledge of truth, but in reality of the blindness, presumption, there is a spirit of opposition to the plain word of God and to the testimony of his spirit. There is a spirit of idolatrous exaltation of mere human reason above the revealed wisdom of God. That's what they have done. The seven Adventists, churches, conferences have put human reason above the word of God. Hence, the apostasy continue. And the next article says this here. Adventist today, it says, commissioning of executive pastor at Walla Walla University Church. Commissioning what? Notice, the Walla Walla University Church made history recently with the what? With the commissioning of executive pastor, Corley, Pastor Corley, is, notice now, the first black woman pastor in the denomination North Pacific Union Conference, the first non-white pastor on staff at the university church, and the first woman from the Bahamas to attend the seminary at Andrews University. And in this video, this man is talking about ordaining this woman, we're going to pray for her to be a pastor now of the church. You can see them in the video ordaining her. Show me in the Bible where you find any woman being ordained into anything. Into anything. Show me from the Bible. This is pure apostasy and abomination. There's no such thing as women elders, women pastors in the Bible. This is not from the Bible. This is a custom of the world that you see there. This is because of the 501c3. They cannot discriminate. So they have to place a woman in the same position as a man inside of the church. 
where my Bible tells me otherwise. This is our apostasy at its highest. The General Conference is taking millions of Seventh-day Adventists to perditions. This is a faithless generation as we looked at before. A faithless generation. Go back now to your Bible. Notice, let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is a faithless and perverse generation. Remember we read that a moment ago? God calls the church a faithless, perverse generation. Notice, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Again, brothers and sisters, do you believe that Jesus is greater than what is transpiring in our world today? Hmm? Do you believe that? Notice carefully. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we need to be faithful unto death. Amen? Notice verse 23. The Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. What does the word sanctify mean? To set apart, to make holy, right? And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto when? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful, notice the word there. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. What will he do? He will keep you until that perfect day. What day is that? The second coming. This is why he said, be thou faithful unto death. God is faithful. Amen? Amen. And that is part of his characteristics. He cannot deny himself. As a matter of fact, the next passage here confirms this. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Where are we heading to? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be not faithless. Amen? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Notice what the Bible tells us. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. The Bible says... In verse 10 of 2 Timothy, well, let's back up to verse 7. It says, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. The word of God is what? Is not bound. They try to stop Paul from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that the same thing that's happening right now? If you try to violate the so-called draconian laws, you'll be thrown into jail. But Paul says, the word of God is not bound. You cannot stop it. You cannot stop it. Then it says, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. In other words, Paul was saying he was not selfish. He would rather die, give up his life, not only for the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that others as well might come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. To him much is given, much is required. We have been given much, but yet we're keeping it to ourselves because we're afraid. That means you are a selfish person. You're going to die in the wilderness, as we read a moment ago. Notice, it goes on to say, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, notice carefully, we shall also live with him. So what must happen to me? What must happen to us? Because this truth that we have, we cannot bury it. We must die for the truth. And who is the truth? That is Jesus Christ, right? And if we die for him, we will live with him. It says, if we suffer, verse 12, we shall also reign. Beautiful. We shall also what now? Reign with him. If we deny him, what would happen? He will also, he also will deny us. If we believe not, notice the word believe there, Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot, what is the word? Deny himself. Because faithfulness is one of the attributes of God. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says, God has called us to be faithful. That is part of the first angel's message. That is part of the third angel's message. That is part of the fourth angel's message. God needs 
some faithful men and women in these last days to shine the glory of Jesus Christ. As we read a moment ago in Isaiah chapter 60, the world is plunging into deeper and deeper darkness every day. This is not the time to retreat, brothers and sisters. How many of you would like to say, Lord, send me. Here am I. What is it? Send me. God is calling people right now to go to the front line. Are you willing to do so? Yes. Hmm? I hope you're not just saying this, but you will put it into action. Let's pray. Loving Father, our God, which art in heaven, thank you for the mighty works that you have done in our lives and are doing at this time. Now, you want us to reveal to the world the glory of Jesus Christ, the mighty work that he can do if we are faithful. Help us not to be unfaithful. Help us, Lord, to pick up the banner of truth, regardless of what's happening, to glorify you and you only. And remind us, there is nothing new under the sun. What we are facing today, many who came before us had to face similar issues. But also remind us that we are very close to the heavenly Canaan. And so, by faith, we can make it. The enemy is trying everything to distract us, even to bring about fear to cause us to fall by the wayside. But as John the Baptist says, keep our eyes focused on the Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.